Hello friends, and welcome to my new video, in which I'll tell you some amazing stories. But before we begin, please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button on this video. Also, don't forget to write your thoughts about these stories down in the comments. Let's get started. Karen's team demands money back. I am the sole proprietor of a small inn with 10 rooms. I work practically non-stop, and I'm the only one here because I live adjacent to the inn in a house. The hotel is old, having been constructed in the 1970s and has only been under new ownership for approximately two months. Since January, I've been working and residing here. All of the propane heaters were turned off by the new owners as they gradually renovated each room before switching to electric heating. All of the rooms currently have brand new space heaters, with the exception of rooms 7, 8, and 10. The new space heaters kept tripping the breaker, so we had to keep the older models in those rooms. On full blast, they'll still heat those spaces to the point of being ovens. A week before they were going to hire someone to accomplish that, the awning collapsed because of all the snow we had experienced this year. There had been plans to rewire everything sometime last month, carport, overhang, and awning, whatever name you choose. Therefore, we had to put a lot of their projects on hold so that we could concentrate on getting things corrected. Because the traditional office was now inaccessible owing to the fallen awning, we had to set up a temporary office in one of the rooms, but, but thus far there hasn't been a problem, except for me, since before when the office was adjacent to the house and I could check people in and make appointments more quicker and simpler, I now have to wait for a phone call to know anyone's arrived and had to walk out there to make reservations and check people in. Even if our prices aren't low, they're not outrageously high. Since we're a three-star hotel, we have set the room rates in the center. It's also a good idea to keep in mind that the weekend is currently in the middle of it, and weekends typically have higher rates. Our story will begin with my entitled guests as its major subject. Have no idea what his name is, and have no desire to find out. Give him the name Kevin. Around 10.30 yesterday night, Kevin and his family called to ask about available rooms for them. On the other end of the call was his wife, who was inquiring about the pricing mentioned on Expedia. I now utterly detest Expedia. They offer their members rates that are much lower than our standard accommodation rate, and after all the fees we must pay them, we barely make any money off of them. But it's not my problem if folks make reservations through Expedia and the price ends up being that high. Expedia's offer is that. However, I am unable to provide flat rate Expedia costs over the phone. Not at all like Expedia. They adjusted their tone after hearing this, and simply requested a senior discount. I don't know if they were lying or not in order to get the discount, but I won't dispute. I genuinely offer discounts frequently to those who politely request them. Literally, it's not a huge deal. Anyway, they show up 30 minutes later and pull into our meager parking lot with a pickup and a sizable trailer in tow. Even though I'm awful at gauging size, it was larger than the truck itself, approximately the same size as a huge horse transporter. However, our parking area is only equipped to accommodate a maximum of 10 cars, and this item takes up half of that space. They responded that they were comfortable where they were when I advised they park it on the side of the road next to the home, where they would find it much easier to get out. After check-ins, people normally relocate their cars, so I didn't see anything wrong with them being there temporarily. But when they check in, they demand to see the rooms first. That's also not a big deal, but the manner he asked felt a little abrupt and not very pleasant. He inquired, can I get the room key? Before I had even checked him in or charged his card, he then emphasized that it was to see the room after I gave him a perplexed expression. After inspecting the firmness of the bed in the king room he had reserved, he responded, yep, that's good. He responded, nope, when I asked him whether he wanted to see the other room he had rented. It's irrelevant. We will still remain here tonight. Since I hadn't yet charged them for their accommodation, I had to remind them that I still needed a signature as they started unpacking everything to take into their rooms. The wife didn't enter for a while, so I gave her the room rates again when she did. I told them for the second time, and she responded, Yeah, that's okay. She then looked over the receipt I had given her carefully, but I'm not even sure what she was looking for. I informed her of the cost. They had successfully negotiated a senior citizen rate for the accommodations and had never complained. 
The prices Expedia listed us at led me to believe they were looking for a better bargain, yet they reserved our most expensive accommodations without even trying to haggle. Once more, I offer decent discounts to customers who politely inquire or who disclose their financial situation. However, those same individuals also generally avoid reserving the most expensive lodging. Kevin said, no one else is going to show up tonight, so I'm going to stay parked there, as they were departing our makeshift office. We're going to leave quite early. This presented a challenge. I had to explain to them that I had customers come in to reserve a room at various hours of the night, sometimes even up until 2 a.m., while he was parked right in the middle of the parking lot. He merely said that he would move over when I again suggested that he park on the side of the road where there was more space for him. He did move it, but he was still a big space eater. Although it wasn't a busy night, there was now space for someone to pass him and enter the temporary office, so I just decided to leave it alone. I inquired as to if they required anything else, and advised them to contact the hotel directly if they did. I'm here practically always, and will try to be of assistance however I can. Let's fast forward to the next morning, when I receive a call at precisely 6 in the morning. The first thing Kevin says to me when he calls me is something along the lines of, this was the worst experience I've ever had at a motel. I want a reimbursement. I was just roused, so I don't recall his exact words, but due to how out of control my sleep schedule has become, I typically don't get out of bed until at least 8 in the morning. You know, with folks wandering in at 2 in the morning looking for a room. I inquire as to the problem. He replies that there was no heat in the rooms, no hot water, and they were unable to sleep due to the noisy space heaters. He says, it's okay, when I ask if I can go outside and look at the heaters. I assured him that the thermostat was functional when he acquired about it in the previous evening. However, I was unaware that the owners had completely switched off the propane heaters, leaving only the space heater heating the place. As I've already mentioned, space heaters do a great job of warming up the rooms. When unoccupied, they just remain on their lowest setting. Thus, it is up to the visitor to increase the heat. Anyway... When I arrived to check on the heater, it was unquestionably warm inside. I was shivering outside, but not inside the room. That's when I noticed the heater's pilot light was out after checking it. I asked them whether they had switched the space heater up from the lowest setting and apologized for my error, but I also emphasized that it was more than sufficient to warm the room. He answered, It doesn't matter if the space heater works or not, brazenly ignoring my query. The thermostat is obviously not working, as I previously inquired. We were unable to get a good night's sleep since that space heater shook all through the night. He then claims again that there's no hot water, and I explain that since he is in one of the inn's farthest rooms, it takes some time for the water to reach them. Since it was an ancient hotel, there are some imperfections. Kevin says, that's no justification. I've stayed in hotels that are older than this while traveling the world, and I have never experienced this issue. He requests a refund, and I tell them I need to speak with my boss first. They want Kevin to speak on my behalf as I head inside and grab my phone. I enjoy listening to his complaints about his stay again, telling my employer that we were grossly overcharging for our rooms and defrauding customers as I return outside and hand over my phone to them. If he didn't receive his refund, Kevin began threatening to post negative reviews online for weeks on end. And let's be clear here, we're a tiny family-run business that recently started using Expedia, thus there were only like two reviews on there. After a brief argument, they agreed to at least accept a full refund for one of the rooms they stayed in, since if he truly did start submitting tons of negative reviews, our reputation and subsequent company would suffer. The wife stops by and observes me as I started up when I go outside to the makeshift office, in order to remind my aunt how to use our system because it wasn't functioning as it should, I had to phone her in the middle of the night. However, since the system had changed, I ultimately had to do it in a new manner. I ultimately had to repay the full money and then reload their card, albeit at a discounted rate. I offered to give the wife a receipt when she asked, but I didn't think the refund would appear on it. It didn't, in fact. However, I informed her that 7246 had already been deducted from the total, and that there was still a balance of 7246 that needed to be paid. Her card would only be charged the remaining 7246. I think these are the costs, don't take my word for it. She began to become irritated with me because I didn't understand why I didn't need to see her credit card in order to issue the refund. I've never worked in a hotel before, so I don't know how other places operate. 
However, in this case, the guest data and payment information are saved in the system for quicker guest returns, saving us from having to enter all of the guest data again. I didn't need to view her card again because the system already had her information. For instance, I never requested to see an ID. We take it really easy around here. Anyway, she was still perplexed by the receipt, so I simply demonstrated the return process to her on my computer. She then informed me that the Wi-Fi wasn't functioning before she departed. I assured her that because my personal phone was linked to the Wi-Fi, everything was running smoothly. Then you must have written it down incorrectly, she said, because even our daughter, who is very tech savvy, was unable to make it work, which is absurd. Since I've been staying here, the password has never changed and it has served every other visitor just fine, except for a few elderly couples for whom I had to manually enter the password. They are also the ones who have informed me that the phone number on the door is invalid, despite the fact that I entered the number manually and it was successful. When they had finished, I went into each of the rooms they had been in, and sure enough, the space heaters were still on the lowest settings, and the water was heating up perfectly fine. From what I could tell, there was nothing wrong with the rooms, and it seemed like he was merely complaining to avoid having to pay for the rooms in full. I would have been more than ready to go out there, find out if the propane heaters had been turned off, and show them how to crank up their space heaters if they had called me at any point during the night with a question or clarification regarding the heaters. I'm available in here all the time, as I've previously stated. I can't travel anywhere because my car was totaled a month ago. The majority of guests don't have issues with our accommodations, and I've had guests leave tips and thank you cards for the lovely suites. Although primitive, the rooms are not horrible. I really don't like it when someone complains about things that could easily be solved just by talking to the staff. Why immediately create an unpleasant situation if you can just tell the person that something's wrong? Especially when the staff is available 24-7, and this is a very common occurrence nowadays, especially in hotels. Another thing is, when you tell the staff about the problem and the staff is not very adequate, then yeah, you need to complain, write bad reviews, etc. These people look like they're always just trying not to pay or pay much less than they should for everything. For me, this type of money saving is disgusting. It's hard to even call it a type of money saving because most of the time, they're basically just stealing the service candidate at the interview definitely doesn't fully realize who I am. I was a dispatcher for a charter bus company in the middle of the 1970s. Along with assigning work to drivers on various charters, one of my responsibilities was to take prospective new workers for test drives to determine their professionalism and ability to operate the vehicles properly. At the time, about half of our 60-bus fleet had unsynchronized manual transmissions, and a significant portion of those had wet-clutch gearboxes with air throttles, which required a lot of skill to master and provide passengers with a smooth ride. In our standard road test, prospective drivers were first taken for a ride in an automatic transmission bus, before returning the next day for a check ride in one of the manual transmission coaches. Our preferred candidates for new employees were school bus drivers looking for extra work, particularly during the summer months, followed by drivers with experience at other charter bus companies. The majority of the drivers from these transportation businesses at the time had experience with manual transmissions, thus their inspection rides typically went fairly well with very few mistakes. Truck drivers, on the other hand, frequently presented greater difficulties. If they were used to driving 18-wheelers, let's say for example, it would be pretty difficult to get them used to the idea that a 40-foot bus doesn't bend in the middle when turning frequently. They were used to 10, 13, and 15-speed gearboxes that shift incredibly quickly, whereas our buses had simple 4-speeds that seemed honestly to take an eternity to match up with the unsynchronized gears, so shifting could also be a pretty relevant problem for them. I had to pay particular attention to the driver's attitudes while giving them check rides because this company took great interest in its driver's attitudes. Many people were a pleasure to work with. Many were very humble, and others were even hysterically humorous while being dead serious about safety, which was also very important. The ones who came to us with the, I don't care what it is, I can drive anything mentality were my favorites. I created a unique check ride plan specifically for these people because they were the Karens of our day. 
As usual, we took a bus with an automatic transmission for our first trip. Paying close attention to their conversation and demeanor helped me prepare for my next evaluation of their driving abilities. The air-throttled, wet-clutch manual gearbox bus. The throttle had no feel because it operated with air pressure. You could hardly hear the engine because it was 40 feet behind you. And to top it all off, for the extreme Karens, I would place a white styrofoam coffee cup filled with water on the dashboard and warn the driver that if they spilled any of the water while shifting, the check ride was immediately over and they were not getting the car back. So along comes Ken, not his real name. The worst example of a I can drive anything mentality I have ever encountered in my career in the bus industry. 10 years of trucking experience actually hanging over his belt Seeking employment where the freight walks on and off. All right, let's take a drive. He actually drove rather well during the automatic transmission check ride, making good use of the mirrors. He had excellent cornering ability, especially on tighter streets. Everything was pretty solid, but his attitude. He was already a no hire by the end of the check ride, owing to his attitude. But because he insisted he could drive anything, I decided to see whether he could handle one of our sneaky animals. I made care to mention the engine's air throttle mechanism and the unusual wet clutch, unsynchronized, four-speed transmission during the pre-trip examination. He responds, No worries, I can drive anything. As the four-speed shift pattern plaque on the dash shows reverse in the same slot as second gear, the first thing he must do is find out how to put the bus in reverse in order to back out of its parking area. He finally asks me how, after several failed efforts, and I tell him that you have to put it in first, then hold the rev switch on the instrument cluster while pulling the shifter back into second gear slot. You can drive anything after all. That's a strike. We pull away. He grinds it into first, and we pull away from the yard. Since they are known for grinding getting into first from a stop due to their wet clutch design, I decided to overlook it because it's not a second strike. He makes an attempt to shift into second as we travel down the street, and just like he would with a standard 13 speed, it is far too quick for the basic bus 4 speed, causing it to grind incessantly before engaging the gears. Nearly a strike too, but he asks, too fast? And I concur with him, advising him to swap gears a little more slowly. This time he has to make a 1 to 2 and 2 to 3 shift, which he again tries to do too quickly, not allowing the engine speed to reduce for the gears to mesh nicely. We approach a stop sign. He grinds that bad boy in the first again, and off we go. Then we round a bend. He must slow down to the point where he must downshift back to second, since third is way out of the question. This is where the air throttle completely screws him up. He can't, for the life of him, figure out how quickly he needs to rev the engine to put it in gear without severe grinding, and he's now complaining pretty loudly about what a terrible POS this bus was. Then the railroad tracks are reached. He then stopped the bus since he was aware that buses are required to do so at train crossings. However, this crossing was... A little different because the approach had a tiny gradient, making it easy to roll back before the clutch engaged if you weren't careful. Do you still have the water cup? He had been able to keep the water from spilling up to this point, but the railroad crossing proved to be his doom. When the coach began to roll backward as he took off the brakes, he reacted the same way he did with his truck. He let the clutch out too quickly, causing the cup of water to tumble into the stairwell, leading to the front door. Mr. I can drive anything, pulled over, set the brake, got out of the driver's seat, and told me, just take me back to the yard. He realized he'd blown it at that point, and he decided he no longer wanted to drive charter buses for us anyway, especially if he had to deal with the subpar equipment and the difficult-to-shift transmission. When I took over, Ken was utterly astounded. I put the car in first gear without grinding, then shifted it through the 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, and 4 to 2 ratios on the way back to the yard without so much as a single gear grinding, or rolled it back at the last set of tracks next to the shop. I asked him if he still thought this coach was a POS when we parked, but he merely mumbled something incomprehensible before stomping off to his car and disappearing from view. I never got a chance to tell him that, before I was a dispatcher, this 
was the assigned coach I had been using for almost two years, and it was also one of my favorites in the entire fleet. I really don't like such smug people who don't know what they're doing but are already saying that they're professionals. I, I just can't wrap my head around why they do it. It's like they obviously realize that it's very easy to catch them in a lie if you just ask them to do what they are sweetly lying about. But they probably, I guess, hope that it's not going to be checked and that you'll just believe their bravado. I love how you put this candidate in his place. I think you taught him a valuable lesson here. If you treat someone or something badly, you can't be expected to be treated well. There is a balance in the world, and we would all do well to remember that. I hope the other candidates are more well-mannered. Good luck to you. And the last story, in the comments to which you will have to decide and write under the video whether the OP was an a-hole or not. I never imagined myself in this situation, but I'm the one who asked the HOA board members who are 75 years old to help. Having said that, I believe that I was quite understanding and patient, but was simply pushed a little too far. Even yet, you risk being a jerk if you call the HOA at any moment. In February or March, my neighbors set up a bounce house in their yard. Although I couldn't see it, I could hear it when the kids started jumping around 4.30 or 5 a.m., Sincerely, it appeared like the parents would wake the kids up quite early and then send them outside to sleep. However, it was really loud. When I politely spoke with the parents, they informed me that the bounce house was only there for a short time. I put up with it for like three weeks, almost every day, before I finally just said that I work evenings and that the waking up was happening as I was about to fall asleep. To their credit, they stopped jumping in the early morning hours, and things were good, until three weeks ago, when a sizable bounce house unexpectedly emerged in their backyard. My view of the mountains was entirely obscured by an at least 25-foot tall object. I noticed that the children could see directly through my bedroom window from the top. Unfortunately, this happened at the same time that I switched shifts. So the kids were now up until 11 or 12, and on some evenings, even 1 a.m., and I had to get up at 4.30. It wasn't until I noticed that hundreds of gallons of water had pushed all of my dog's waste up against my back door that I even recognized it was also a water slide. The dad basically responded, We were kind enough to change our schedule for you the first time, and this is our backyard, F you, when I went over to talk to them. I came to the conclusion that, I had to take action, since even without the sleep problem, my house might end up being harmed from all this water. So I called the HOA, and according to the way the system operates, my neighbor had been summoned before a board meeting, fined roughly $1,000 for violating the covenants, and forced to pay for the damage to our shared fence. I thought that after that, everything would be fine, except for a few unsavory looks from the neighbor, but virtually Everyone in my family and circle of friends thinks I'm an idiot for attending the HOA meetings. While opinions differ, the consensus is that I am now the grouchy neighbor who spoils the enjoyment for the kids. That if I had simply just worn some noise-canceling headphones, they would have popped the slide at any time and the situation would have resolved itself. The notion, I suppose, is that I complained and got my way by letting loose a lot of busybodies with excessive amounts of free time and unjustified power. What do you think? Usually, I rarely take the side of people who have complained about someone, especially to an HOA. But in this case, I think you did everything right. The actions of your neighbors were really out of line. They were, like, blatantly disrespectful to you and your private property. Pushing the water into your yard is already bad enough, but then the fact that it coalesced into damaging your shared fence and then pushing your dog waste up against your back door? I mean, without this complaint, you would not have resolved this situation with the noise in the early hours, and the damage to your property probably would have fallen to you, based on their attitude. So, I support you. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe, like, and comment.